I'm Dr. Paul Dickinson. I teach tuba and euphonium at Kennesaw State University. Welcome to the special online pandemic edition of the Summer Arts Intensive. I'm thrilled that we're still able to work together. My sincere thanks go to my colleagues and the staff members at Kennesaw State who have made this video series possible. This particular video is going to be talking through brass pedagogy, some of the fundamentals of brass pedagogy, how to establish and maintain an efficient daily routine, and also just in general, how to practice your instrument more efficiently. There will be a play along element to this video later on, so make sure you have your instrument. Please have something to take notes with. You're gonna to wanna to do that. And if you have all those things ready, let's get started. Let's be real. It can be very difficult, even under normal circumstances, to maintain your chops over the summer. Whether you're a high school student, or a middle school student, or a college student, or an adult, it doesn't matter. The moment you're away from the structure that being in school provides, it's easy to let things slide. So it becomes more important that when you do pick up the horn, whether it's for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour, you are approaching it very efficiently with your practice. In the end, what we're looking for is to build a strong foundational skill set on your instrument. It doesn't matter, for instance, if you can play a really high note one time, or if you move your fingers really fast and sort of get the notes out. If you don't sound good doing it, and if you can't consistently reproduce it, then what you're doing is luck, not skill. The players that are winning the auditions, the best and most successful players, are the ones who have built a rock solid fundamental relationship with the instrument. For those players, playing at a high level of quality has simply become a habit. Habits, simply put, are the result of two things. Repetition over time. It's not enough if I simply do a skill 50 times in one day and then don't do it again for a week or two and then try to do the skill again. It is not the quickest way to master that skill. Instead, if I did something 10 times today, and 10 times tomorrow, and 10 times the next day and so on, then in a week or two weeks, I will be well on my way to mastering that skill. And after about 19 to 21 days, give or take, that skill is going to be much more familiar to me and the neural pathways that are forming in my brain will be much more strongly set. So when we're practicing, you can't just play for three hours one day a week and expect that you're going to be champion of the universe. That's not the way you're going to get there. Slow, deliberate, thoughtful, mindful practice in smaller chunks is going to be more successful for you. So when I sit down to practice, oh, I don't know, my Allstate audition, for instance, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna work on a small chunk of that maybe, perhaps the first half of it, or if you wanna do the whole thing, okay. But then I'm gonna isolate those small chunks and I'm gonna focus on just those moments that give me trouble until I'm happy with that moment, that measure or two measures. Then I'm gonna to go to the next couple of measures and I'm gonna work on those. And I'm going to pace this out across a week and then two weeks so that by the end of that time, I'm not just playing from beginning to end, beginning to end, beginning to end, and sort of getting better. I have dug deeper inside of the small moments, whether it's two measures or four bars at a time, and I've made sure that those were exactly the way I wanted them, and then I've plugged those moments back into the big picture. This is the way to efficiently practice, not just measure one to the end, measure one to the end, and hope for the best. Let's talk for a moment about what I meant when I said thoughtful practice or mindful practice. The best kind of practice is going to follow the natural learning process. This is the way that we learn to walk. This is the way that we learned to talk. We have a goal that's well established in our mind of what we wanted to sound like. When we talked, we heard our parents and our family, the people around us talking. That's the reason that we have accents the way we do. I'm from South Carolina. If I was from somewhere else, I would probably sound a little different. When we're learning to walk, uh, we see people walking and we gradually learn motor control 
to the point where we're able to get up and crawl a bit. We can even crawl really fast. But eventually we realize that those people are moving around on two legs. We don't have words for them. We just see that we have those things and we start trying to use them. Are we perfect at first? Absolutely not. We try to stand up and unless somebody's holding onto their hands, they're gonna fall down. Does that stop them? Usually not. They're gonna get up and they're gonna do it again and again and again until eventually they're standing. And then they might try to take their first step. They're gonna fall unless somebody's holding on to them. But that's okay. Trial and error, they continue. They take one step finally, and then two, and then four, and eventually they're walking, and then eventually they're running, and jumping, or racing. It, it, it's amazing what comes from that first effort of just learning to stand. In the same way, if we're practicing our fundamental routine with that acceptance of the trial and error pathway, the natural learning process, maintaining our focus on a goal sound of what we want it to be, and then going through repetitions, trying it, acknowledging the errors, figuring out what those are, and then trying it again. If I'm throwing darts at a dartboard, uh, I'm not going to be staring over here and launching the dart. Somebody's going to get hurt. I'm going to be looking at the dartboard, my goal, in this case, the bullseye, and I'm going to practice the motion and then release. Is it perfect? Probably not. I don't think I'm very good at darts. But if I do it again, I'm going to be a little better. And if I do it again and again and again over the course of several days, I'm going to get better and better at it. And if I do it for years, it's going to be second nature to me. It will be a habit. So when we're practicing, keep your focus on the goal sound. It's really easy when you're doing a physical skill like playing an instrument to internalize your focus. That is, in this case, that means to be paying more attention to what's going on here at the face inside of the process itself, rather than keeping your focus on the product, on the sound that we're trying to produce. Um, should we ignore this completely? Absolutely not. No, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to say that the embouchure itself isn't important. The embouchure is critical. The structure of these muscles determine your success or failure on the instrument. But I am saying that if our focus is only here, then we're ignoring the bigger picture. So I want you to be aware of what's going on here in the muscles, in the face, inside of the process, the breath, etc. But I want our focus to stay on the sound. Here's the difference between focus and awareness. I want you to focus on the pad of my finger, just here at the tip of my index finger. So we're going to stare. Keep your focus on the pad of my finger. Is your brain aware of the fact that my hand is moving around? Yeah, probably so. I bet if I stop moving and then restart, you could tell me exactly when my hand is moving versus when my hand is not moving. But you're not focused on this. Keep your focus on the pad of my index finger. Let go of this. It doesn't matter. In this way, we've maintained focus while still being aware of what's going on around. The feedback loop summarizes the natural learning process. You do the thing, you see what you got out of it, you try to figure out what went wrong, and then you look at what you wanted to do again before you try again and repeat back to step one. So for music, what this means is play small chunks of the music, not the entire piece. Record yourself while you play to make sure that you can go back and find the mistakes, the moments where you didn't sound like you wanted to. And then you go back and you fix those moments. Target them very specifically. Don't just play the whole section over and over again. Use other tools like tuners and metronomes to help yourself. And finally, step four, think back to what you wanted it to sound like, the big picture, and then play the passage again. Be mindful and don't rush the process. That's a lot to talk about with practice. We've talked about why you need to practice. We talked about how to pace yourself with your practice. And we talked about what to practice, the way in which you should practice uh, with the mindfulness and with the feedback loop. Next up, we're going to be talking about the fundamental routine uh, and the elements that should be a part of your routine while you're working on the instrument to make sure that you're getting a comprehensive uh, skill set and not leaving anything out. Uh, this would be a good time if you, if you need to. You could pause the video and go stretch your legs. Uh, get a get some more water, whatever it is that you need. Uh, we will be playing in this next section, so make sure that you come back with your instrument 
And if you want to go ahead and play a couple of notes beforehand, that's A-OK -okay too. So let's talk about fundamental routines, daily practice. All sound begins as some kind of vibration. I've been talking to you guys for the last little while. Uh, what you're hearing is vibrations here in my vocal cords that are then shaped by my mouth, my tongue, my jaw, my lips, that form different consonants and different vowels in combinations that your brain then perceives to be spoken language. For brass players, our vibrating surface is our lip tissue, just here at the center, very specifically, uh, around what's called the aperture, which is a fancy way to say the opening of the lips. So this tissue here is made to vibrate by wind moving past it, so it's a good idea to start any kind of routine or daily practice with just a little bit of attention to the breath and the breathing mechanism. The breathing mechanism has several components. Let's start by talking about the breathing muscle. The breathing muscle is called the diaphragm. It's shaped like a parachute, and it's attached to the inside of your bottom ribs. It completely bisects your torso from front to back, connecting all the way back to your spine and all the way to your sternum in the front. It completely separates your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity. When it contracts, it pulls down slightly and creates a vacuum that pulls air into your lungs. Your lungs are located here in your rib cage. Take two fingers and find your collarbone. The very, very tip top of your lungs is just about back behind there. And the bottom of your lungs is closer to the bottom of your rib cage. It rests very much on top of your diaphragm. So when the diaphragm works, it contracts downwards, pulling in the oxygen, and then it has to release. So what you're going to see is motion in two parts of the body, the abdominal cavity and also the thoracic cavity. What you won't see, hopefully, is tension in the mouth or the neck or the shoulders or the abdomen. If you try to engage your abs and tighten all your muscles and try to breathe in, you can feel them working, the abdominal muscles working against what the diaphragm is trying to do. So let's try a couple of breaths together. If you can, stand up where you are. Take one hand and put it on your belly. Take the other hand and move it all the way up onto the side of your rib cage. Make sure your shoulders are relaxed. And we're going to take a couple of breaths in. You're going to see motion here and also here. Nice and relaxed. You can see that the rib cage is engaged just as much as what's going on here. If I only have motion in one of those two areas, just in the belly or just in the chest and shoulders, I'm missing out on some of my capacity. So relax the belly, make sure that your shoulders don't get involved in the breath, and make sure that you keep everything else natural. Don't overwork this. Let's try a couple of breathing exercises now. The first exercise I'd like to work through today is a five count breath expansion, where we're gonna be stretching our arms up while we breathe in, 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 nice and full of air, clap on count five, and then let the arms go while holding onto the breath. You're gonna feel a lot of expansion in the ribs. This gets the shoulders out of the breath and forces it more into the body. I want you to breathe in through an O vowel shape because that's nice and open and relaxed. I don't want any E's and maintain that O vowel shape the entire time. I'm going to do it once so you can see what I'm talking about. So A, E, I, O. Now I'm going to breathe in. I'm still very full of air. I haven't released the air. I'm going to be dropping my arms now, but I'm still full of air. You can see that my rib cage is still very expanded. I'm still very full of air, but my voice is the same. So at no point was my throat caught up in the breath. And that's going to be our goal. So expanding over five counts and let the throat stay out of it. Hold on to that O vowel shape the entire time. Let's try it together now. We've got five counts. Nice big breath in. Ready and go. In, two, three and four and you're there holding on to the breath holding on to the o vowel shape let the arms come down do you feel the expansion in the rib cage kind of move around a little bit now try saying one 
let go of that air. Big breath in, and let it go again. Did you sound normal when you said the word one? Let's try this one more time. Big breath in, ready, and go in, and two, stretching up, four, and clap. Holding onto the breath, holding onto that old vowel shape, let go of the arms, feel the expansion in the body, say one, and release the air. If you can get to the point where you still sound the same when you're full of air as you do when you're talking normally or conversationally, that's a good sign. That means that you're starting to hold the air into the body and you're keeping your throat from getting engaged while you breathe. So try this on your own a few times if you'd like. Otherwise, let's go on to the next exercise. The last breathing exercise I have for you is breathing in counts. This is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Uh, breathing in counts is something uh, that is a lot more realistic to what you're going to eventually have when you're playing on your instrument. So we're going to start by breathing in for four and then out for four. We'll do that a couple of times. Then we're going to breathe in for three, out for four still, in for two, out for four still, and then in for one and out for four. I'm always going out for four beats because that's more realistic to what you're doing on your instrument. As a disclaimer, if you are starting to get lightheaded, please stop. This is not a hero exercise. You don't get points for individual heroism. Uh, you just pass out, and that's not a good thing for you. Hyperventilation isn't great for, the, for your brain. So protect yourself, be safe about this, find where your limits are, and be okay with that. You can pause the video, Breathe slowly through your nose and kind of equal out your oxygen levels and then maybe try again after a, a short while. Okay? So here we go. Four and four, three and four, two and four, one and four, and then we'll be done. I'll be coaching you vocally as we go. Let's get started. Big breath in. Let it go. Here we go. Ready and go. In, two, three, four, and out, and two. Let's do that one again. Four. One and two, in, 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 out. Take all the counts. Here's three and four. One and two, we end up three, e end up out. Two and three, one more of those. And in and two, we end up three, e end up out. Two, two and four now. Go in, 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 out. Two, take all the counts. Go in, 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 out. And two and one and four now. In, 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 out. And two and three and four and in, 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 out, and two, one more of those, and four, and in, 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 out, two, three, in through your nose, relax. The goal here is that your one count breath, breathing in in one count, is just as full and just as relaxed as when you had four counts to breathe in and three counts to breathe in. So if back when we were breathing in for four counts, you were getting tension. You got to go back and fix it there first. So go back to your O vowel, breathing past the lips, and letting the body fill naturally and easily. And then take that to your three count, to your two count, and eventually to your one count. Make sure that you're taking all of the possible subdivisions. Every single 16th note of the time to breathe in, I'm going to use it. One e and a out. One e and a two e and a out. I'm going to as opposed to it doesn't do you any good so use all the time that you have do you really hear a whole lot of my inhale when I'm doing it right even in a one count breath it's not going to be a whole lot of sound again Feel free to pause the video or rewind and try this one again if you want another crack at it. It's a good exercise, it's important, but again, be safe. Now that we've had time to work the breath just a little bit, let's start making vibrations. Uh, we're going to start by doing a little bit of buzzing on the mouthpiece, so make sure you have your mouthpiece with you. Um, the important thing here while we're working on the mouthpiece is to make sure that we hear the difference between a thin buzz and a full wind driven vibration. Uh, the thickness of the vibration itself, uh, the, if you hear depth in the sound, that's a good sign. Uh, if you feel like it's pinched or it's irregular, uh, then something is muscling too hard. The wind is not interacting comfortably. It's not interacting organically with the, with the lips. It's being forced. 
As we're buzzing around, uh, we're going to make sure that we emphasize something called a glissando, trombone, so you know exactly what that is already, uh, but making sure that we have a consistent sound from the beginning of each exercise to the end of each exercise as we move up and as we move down, not letting it cut in and out as we change pitches. Let's talk about how to change pitch on the mouthpiece. I'm not going to say tighten your muscles and loosen your muscles. I, I think that some of that is involved in changing pitch, absolutely. I'm going to describe it maybe a little differently or maybe exactly the same as your band director has already said. What I'm going to talk about is air temperature and air speed. As I'm working to buzz higher, I want to buzz using colder, faster, slightly more focused air. Uh, if I'm looking to buzz lower, I'm going to make the air hotter. I'm going to let the air slow down, and I'm going to let the air column itself be broader. So, for instance, uh, if you were to hold up your hand and blow as though you had a dust bunny in your hand, we'll call that a baseline that feels like a medium temperature. If I were to hold my hand up and pretend that it is a mirror and fog that mirror and get it really foggy, that is a broader, slower, hotter airstream. It's important to note that when I'm breathing like this, I'm running out of air faster. That doesn't mean that the air speed itself passing my lips is faster. That just means that the quantity of air coming out is higher. And lastly, let's, uh, let's say you hold up one finger and you pretend that it's a, a birthday candle. You hold that candle out and you want to cool off, you want to blow off the candle. When I'm doing that, the airstream is colder more focused, uh, and it's faster air as it moves past the lips. Maybe let's do one more. If you cup your hand, or your hands, and you pretend that this is a bowl of uh, hot soup, and you want to cool off the soup without <coughs> blowing it off the, uh, out of the bowl, uh, that air is much more directed and very, very cold. So as I'm doing this, and you're watching the video, you can see that the musculature is doing bad uh, hugely different things. Very open to get the hot air, very focused and closed in to get the cold air. But the thing that they all have in common is that the air is the primary focus. I am more worried about getting air past the lip, not just forming the muscles in a specific way. It's that focus, that prioritization of the air first, and then letting the muscles respond and let the air tell the muscles how it should be here instead of thinking here that's going to allow you to start to get better sound when you prioritize sound instead of muscle adjustments okay so for our first buzzing exercise we're going to be doing something that i like to call mouthpiece sirens the goal here is to keep the same sound from the beginning note to the top note and then back down or vice versa from the beginning note to the bottom note and back down we'll be using a glissando which means i'm looking for that smeared continuous vibration all the way through, and hopefully we're going to have the same sound behind it. What we don't want is the sound to thin out at the top. For instance, is not what we're after. Is more of what we want in an exercise like this. Horns, you will be displaced. You are not going to be playing in unison with the rest of us. Uh, so for everyone, I encourage you to have a instruments we're starting here on our B flat horns you should be starting on your F or just there okay I encourage you all to have one of these apps and then also have a metronome that you can run while you're going through this exercise it will sound something like this to do this one from high to low back upwards uh, you can do these exercises at 
any number of intervals, both wider and narrower, depending on what you want. You can go from high to low, or low to high, or back and forth. In the end, it's all about making sure that you're getting a continuous uh, sound as you move between the different registers. Make sure that this is primarily an air change, hot air to cold air, and cold air to hot air as you go from low to high and high to low, uh, as opposed to worrying too much about squeezing the muscles. What we want is oh versus oh where it changes. So here's my next one. see me using here is a breath builder. Um, air goes in, and if I'm using the right amount of air, I'm using enough air, the, ball, the ping pong ball is blown through the top of the tube. So, those are our two buzzing exercises. Your turn with this. Make sure you set your metronome, check your pitch using an app, and take it away. So, uh, I think that's just about got it for buzzing. Let's move into the next thing now. It's time to actually play our long tones. Long tones are by far the most basic but important fundamental that you will find in any brass player's handbook. This is where we build our relationship to the instrument. This is where we learn to maintain that relationship with the instrument. Whether we're working on tone, whether we're working on pitch, whether we're working on articulation, Trombone players, making sure that we know how to move our slide positions quickly and efficiently and accurately. Making sure that we have a better developed sense of tempo and time and pulse. Making sure that we are working on different dynamic ranges, getting louder and softer, playing our long tones at the loudest possible and the softest possible, not just always at mezzo mezzo. And making sure that we can access different ranges and have control in the different extreme ranges, both high and low. If we can do it in a long tone, we're going to have a lot better chance of being able to execute that when it comes time to perform. This next exercise needs very little introduction. This is a Remington long tone pattern that a lot of you probably already do almost every day in band class or maybe something like it. It's played with one column of air for seven straight beats, regardless of the fact that you're having to change the length of pipe in the middle of, the, of that column of air. Um, make sure that you set your, set your metronome. 72 would probably be fair for this. Make sure you're taking a good full breath on beat four of every second measure. And pay attention to your pitch by turning on a drone or turning on a tuner while you're playing. Make sure that you work this not just with the exercises that I've written here, but also start on B flat and go down, start on F and go up. Every range of the instrument is fair game and every dynamic is fair game. So mix it up, have some fun. I'm gonna leave you all to this one. Take it away. I'll see you soon. Next up we have flow studies. Flow studies are basically moving long tones in the same way that we had seven counts of continuous forward moving air in the last exercise without letting it slow down or letting it stop. We want the same forward momentum all the way across each one of these phrases. I've written it with a split in the middle. If you get to the point where you are in good control of this and or you're playing at a very soft dynamic, you can do this entire exercise from the first note all the way across to the last note. Something else to try with a flow study like this, since it's so much about and getting the air immediately to the beginning, sometimes I'll go through and I'll air start the first note a couple of times just to make sure that the air is really working well for me before I get into the rest of what I'm doing. So I'm going to go through my vowels, A, E, I, O, nice and relaxed and open, and taking a great breath.
free to try these up an octave, down an octave, wherever you want to do them. Uh, horns, your partials are very different than everybody else's. So again, your first one is not nearly as easy as everyone else's first one here. And the second one, obviously, is probably a little bit more idiomatic for you. Feel free to mix these things up, change up the key. There's no rules about this other than continuous air and keeping a great Keep in mind, that's only a couple of ways that you can do long tones. Uh, in the end, be creative, find your own way with this, whether it's just a single static long tone that you sustain, breathe, and then play another one, whether you're doing it with a static note that you constantly return to, whether you're doing it as a flow study where you play it as though it's a long tone, but you change uh, slide length or valve combinations up and down the scales or arpeggios, be creative. In the end, all that matters is that you're keeping that air flowing as though you were playing a single note. Make sure that you do your long tones using a tuner, using a drone, and using a metronome. The only difference between a tuner and a drone is that a tuner is reactive. It's going to tell you if you missed the bullseye, and the drone is giving you that bullseye. So I'm going to spend a lot of time with a drone first to make sure that I'm able to hit the bullseye and that my ear is trained in finding that pitch. And then when I feel comfortable, I will start to move over and use a tuner more. Okay, let's move over and do uh, our next section, which is gonna be flexibility, lip slurs. So I've got good news for you on the flexibility front. We've already done it. When we were doing our mouthpiece work earlier, that practicing going up and down, sliding around using that glissando, smeary kind of air, that's essentially what we're gonna be doing with our lip slurs, with our flexibility exercises. So for a moment, make sure that you always go back to your mouthpiece if in doubt, uh, and spend that moment buzzing through the series that you're trying to play. Not looking to slot the pitches necessarily, but rather working through it as though it were a nice smooth roller coaster ride. Then you plug it back into the instrument and it adds resistance and that's about it. So if you're starting your lip slurs, you go back to your mouthpiece, slide through it with a glissando, plug it into the horn, and try to smear your way through it. You can do this with half valving. You can pull out the first valve of your instrument and just buzz on the lead pipe, things like that to add kind of a bridge between just doing mouthpiece and then working on the lip slur. Find ways to get control of that, not just trying to lip slur and muscle your way through it. This is an air change more so than a muscle change. Air first, muscle second. When we're blowing our way through the upper register, it's going to be colder air, lower register, hotter air. As we're changing from partial to partial, note to note, let that air reflect that. When I'm going lower, I'm going to be filling it up and getting a nice warm open sound. The mistake that a lot of people run into is that when they slur up, everything tightens up and then they stay tight when they're trying to work their way back down. The sound suffers, the pitch suffers, the speed of the lip slur suffers, etc., etc. I've got to make sure that the air is actually changing and that I'm keeping a nice, full, wind-driven vibration all the way through the exercise. You can, you can discover that, test it on your mouthpiece. Let's try a few exercises with this. I'd like to take just a moment to show you a couple of toys that I like to use uh, to assist with some of this stuff. This is a bell rim mouthpiece rim. It's made to simulate the rim of the mouthpiece, except without any of the extra resistance that the mouthpiece comes with. So, it's just you making mouth noises. It's a good way to remind us that it has to be wind passing the lips giving us our buzz. If we're trying to be too tense, it comes across really clearly. So, what we're looking for is a nice, easy, relaxed uh, pitch to buzz. Like number one, this three note series. So try it with your mouthpiece. If you 
happen to have a room, deal with that. Uh, and then when you feel ready, put on your Smith Smith metronome for round 72 and see if we can keep this very smooth and connected. Number two, the four note series is simply adding one more partial higher uh, using some of the same patterns that we were just working through. So in the same way that we just used that mouthpiece room to help us there, one column of air getting all that vibration attached. Very easy to keep uh, all set to go. So let's move over to, over to number two. Again, set your metronome. Around 72 is still fine. See you in just a moment. Looking ahead at number three, uh, there's another toy I like to use with this stuff. Uh, this is a 3D printed mouthpiece. It's made to mimic the Con Heliver tuba mouthpiece, which happens to be the one I, I play on. Uh, so it's similar in the rim and similar in the shape. Uh, the advantage here is that I can plug this into my tuba and practice buzzing while fingering along to the solos, etc. It's pretty convenient. The lesson here of what I want you to pay attention to with the rim is as we go into our low register, and the tubas I'm talking to you very specifically, uh, but everybody struggles with this just a little bit. We like to let go of the structure of the embouchure when we go to our lower range. That's going to take away all your control, and it certainly takes away your sound. You'll be working harder when you need to to get sound out of this. Check out what happens on the rim when I lose my structure. As I try to go down, nothing happens. The buzz goes away. That means that you've been depending on the resistance of the mouthpiece or the resistance of the tuba to give you your low register. That's not a healthy way to go. So I want to make sure that the structure of the outside stays firm, not tight, but firm, and that the middle is of the embouchure here around the aperture, the opening, is what opens up and relaxes. Here how the buzz stays is a lot more consistent. You can hear that centering to it when I go lower. Let's hear what that sounds like on the tuba now. First without structure and then with the structure. That doesn't sound good. It's got a lot more centering to the sound. It's a much more pleasant sound. And I'm able to maintain that vowel shape. Oh, 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 as I'm working my way down. That's a keeper. So in number three, the five note series with the optional lowered chord. All the same rules apply in the upper register and mid register that we had recovered. If you're going for that lower note, keep the structure firm on the outside, free in the center. Firm, free. Have fun. See you in a minute. Last but not least for our flexibility exercises, I wanted to have one included that worked us all the way up to our seventh and eighth partials. Uh, so getting on up into our upper register for the B flat instruments. Rick Horns, you are way beyond the seventh and eighth partials with this one. If you want to try this down an octave, go for it. If you want to sit this one out, that's your choice too. So let's set our metronomes for now around uh, in the high 60s. Let's go with 65. These are 16th notes. We're going to the upper register. It's going to be very easy to want to force this. Make sure that you go nimbly. Go for agility instead of trying to bull your way through. Think of the airflow as the gasoline going through the motor. If the gas is pinched off, the motor stops working. So ah, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, making sure that we keep that round vowel shape instead of biting it off and blocking the flow with our teeth or pinching it off with our lips or blowing really hard and closing our throat after it. So nice and easy. From the beginning, first note is concert F. One E and a two E and a ready M. Easy as that. Feel free to keep doing it at this speed on your own, or you can go faster, or you can go slower. You can take a break in the middle, 
Or if you don't feel 100% ready for this yet, you can just do the first measure of this, and that'd be a good exercise to do. Take it away. We'll see you in just a minute. Keep in mind, those are just a few exercises. Be creative with this. There are as many lip slur combinations out there as you care to come up with. Let's move over into our next section, articulation. For me, articulation means note shape, or the shape of the air column that passes the lips. So for a staccato articulation, it's going to be a short burst of air. For tenuto, full value, or legato, the smooth playing, it's going to be a longer column of air. For your accents, it's going to be a bigger amount of air at the beginning of the note and less air passing the lips towards the end. Ta, and it tapers away. For marcato, you got the first half of that. Ta, nice big column of air that comes through very quickly, as though an accent and a staccato were combined. Regardless of the shape of the note that you're after, the job of the tongue remains relatively simple. It literally only has two things to do. Number one, it has to make a clean consonant. Number two, it has to make an open vowel. So clean consonant that moves efficiently to an open vowel. Clean consonants would be things like T or D, t -t -t, or D, D, D. There's a very clear, precise point of contact, T, as opposed to a TH sound, th, th, where it's a little bit thick. You absolutely, or ra or la, where the tongue makes is a little bit too slow. You absolutely want to avoid any consonants like P or B, P, B, because they're messing with the lips. So you want to make sure that the tongue is in charge of creating your articulation, not your throat, not your lips. Your vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y will sneak in there. We have to pick an open one. The most open one would be O. If you're playing in a, a high brass instrument or in the upper mid register, you're maybe an A, ah, an A, A, ah, as opposed to E, E, H, E. So, a ah or O oh are your most common ones. In the extreme upper register, I want U. So I've got that same roundness that are, exist in A ah and O, oh, the teeth are still apart. U, uh, not U, uh, where it all closes down and you bite on the note. Uh, and tubas in your lowest register, A, ah, A W sound. So from top to bottom, we have U, uh, A, ah, O, oh, and A ah, as we work our way into the bottom register. The same will hold true for multiple tonguing. As you begin to work on double tonguing and triple tonguing and trying to move faster through things, I'm gonna be using a clean consonant in the back of the tongue as well as in the front of the tongue. So if I'm using a T in the front, I wanna use something like a K in the back. Ka, ka, ka. Make sure that you're not getting ka, 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 where the tongue kind of rasps a little bit. You want a nice clean K. Ta, ka, ta, ka. Front, back, front, back. If I'm using D or a legato articulation, da, 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 in the front, I want to match that in the back. I'm going to use a G sound, ga, so da, ga, da, ga, or ta, ka, ta, ka. You can hear how the T and the K combination is a little more aggressive than the D and the G combination, which is going to give you some smoothness. So if I'm looking for a really uh, machine gun kind of sound, ta, ka, ta, ka, ta, ka, ta, ka, ta, ka, ta, ka, ta, I'm going to stick with T and, K, uh, T and K. And if I'm looking to do, 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 I'm going to go with a D and a G, so that's a little bit smoother, a little bit more flowy, if you will. If in doubt about how to test your articulations and make sure that you're getting the, the one that you want, go back to the speech pattern. I always defer to the speech pattern. So if I can speak, I know that I'm getting the same consonant and the same vowel. If I'm getting, I'm going the wrong direction. And when I put that on the horn, it's got to have both con uh, consonant and open vowel. Got to have both. The vowel is where the air actually comes through in the first place. So uh, make sure that we don't have a capital consonant at the first of, uh, of your uh, note. Ta, ta, ta. It's always going to come across as heavy and thuddy. The tongue's job is to get out of the way quickly to let, let the air pass the vowel. So I always think of the consonant as being a lowercase t or a lowercase d. And I think about the vowel as being an uppercase o or a. So little t, big o would be to, 
versus big T, little o, which is to. And that just gets in the way. So small consonant that moves efficiently to a big open vowel. Let's try some articulation exercises now. Next up is articulation. What you're going to see in the page in front of you is going to be a series of patterns. Uh, pattern 1, pattern 2, pattern 3 that are all slightly mixed up versions of similar rhythm, uh, taking you through varieties of quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, and at least one triplet for you. Um, on the second line, you'll see that I add in more specific articulation in the line, and also moving around while articulating. If you want to have more examples like number seven, where you're moving around and articulating, my suggestion is that you go back to the flexibility section and just don't slur through them, hum your way through them, and I think that'll be really good practice for you as well. Just like the flexibility thing and the flow study all come from the long chain, one consistently moving column of air, our articulation has to do the same thing. Just like links on the chain or beads or pearls attached to a necklace, it all has to be moving in one column of air still, and the notes are simply attaching to that. So, if I were to play, for instance, number one, and I wanted to do it around metronome 112, it would be to ta 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 to and the speech pattern to ta 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 to is mimicking exactly what I want the horn to sound like. Maybe I do it on the in the key of concert F. <laughs> As with the other sections, keep in mind that that's only a small sampling of some of the exercises that you can do. Articulation is good to be worked in scales. It's good to be working with that in arpeggios and moving around on the instrument, as well as simply being able to play in a straight line on a single static note. I think that's just about everything for articulation. Uh, let's move over to some range extensions.
everybody wants to be able to play the high notes. They're the impressive ones. They're the ones that soar. You know, you, you see your favorite player that plays this super crazy high note, and you go, wow, that's amazing. They got there with very regimented structured practice, and their high range shares similarities and consistencies with their lower register. In a lot of ways, I want the low mid register and the success we have there with getting a nice full rich sound to teach the upper register how it should sound. In the same way, we like to ignore our low registers sometimes. It's really easy to just kind of stop it, you know, at wherever you had about, oh, I'm a perfect fourth or so below your concert B flat. You need to make sure that you're working into your pedal registers. This goes for you too, trumpets. It's really good to be able to slur your way down there and maintain that buzz. Uh, tubas and euphoniums, it is absolutely essential that you work on your low register for some obvious reasons. You will have fan pieces that take you down below low F. You got to get down to low E, low E flat, low D. Preferably, you're going to make it all the way through the full octave down to your low B flat. You're given four valves, which means that you can get most of the way there. Euphoniums, the same goes for you. If you don't have a compensating euphonium, if you have a four valve non-compensating euphonium, you should still be able to get down through at least low D or low D flat. Let's go through a couple of exercises for this now, and just a couple. So range building number one, uh, start with what's written and move up by a half step. Let's do a couple of these together. Starts in the key of F, and then you move up a half step, and then you move up a half step. Uh, sustain that last note just for three beats for now since we're going to be trying to do it together. Uh, I'm going to set my metronome to 72. And away we go. Okay, yeah. One, two, and. <laughs> smooth air down through the triplets. You can slur through those if you like, uh, a legato tongue if you prefer, uh, but make sure that we're not radically allowing anything to change through those results. Range builder number two is very similar. Uh, if you're not as comfortable with your range yet, range builder number two is a, probably a better place for you to start. We're starting very low in the sequence. We're starting with our fourth valve or valves one and three, uh, or if you're on trombones, slide switch number six, Horns, I encourage you to go ahead and use your regular fingering for those. Um, in the same idea, if you want to go back to the mouthpiece for everybody with this and kind of buzz your way through it and then put it on the horns, it's not a bad idea. Uh, and last but not least on the page, you see low range or sustained range. Take some time with those. A lot of people only focus on the high range and they neglect the low range. So these low range extensions are going to be quite slow. Uh, if I step down towards about 40. So... just based on what notes are possible. So trumpets, if you're in trombones eventually, you start having to come back up, that's okay. Make sure you're leading to the bottom note. Let's try this one together, starting with low range extensions. One, and two, and steady, and... <laughs> If 
sliding from note to note. I never let the air stop. I'm not trying to slot those notes. I'm looking for the air to always move through them. Eventually, I want that transition to happen very quickly between the notes, but that doesn't mean it's going to be aggressive. All right, that does just about covers it for range stuff. Take a few minutes with this. Experiment with what's going on. Keep it smooth and don't bite that C sharp vowel open. Let's get to it. Those are always fun. Stick with it. Be patient. Take your time. It will come. But make sure that you're not doing anything weird and squeezing. There is effort involved, but too often I run into students who have gotten in their own way, especially in the high register. The last thing that we're going to talk about is dynamic extremes. You hopefully are including dynamic extremes, both very, very loud and very, very soft as as much as 20% of your daily routine words. So when I'm doing long tones, I'm going to be practicing them up to fortissimo or more. And I'm going to be practicing them to pianissimo or less, as far down as I can get them to maybe just even a whisper of a tone. If I don't practice to those extremes, I will not be able to execute great dynamic uh, sound when I'm in my solo performances or when I'm playing in band. The thing that I'm listening for in my long tones is not tone first when I'm doing dynamic work. I'm actually listening for pitch first, and that's important. If I can keep the pitch in the middle as I get louder and louder and louder, the tone often follows. So practice dynamic extremes, focus first on pitch of what you want in the center of the note, do it with a drone, do it with a tuner, and then let the sound grow around that same centered pitch. If I'm blowing more air to get louder and I don't, compensate correctly with my teeth to open up a little bit, that air starts getting forced and goes faster, and that's where we drive sharp. And vice versa, is if we're the same, if these are my teeth and they're the same space apart, and I'm getting softer and using less air to get softer, the sound starts to droop, and that's where we go flat. So focus on pitch, maintain the pitch center as you get louder and softer. Uh, I've got two on the page here, and I encourage you to go back and try both of these ideas. The first exercise is static sitting on one long note getting louder and then on the same long note getting softer. Do this up and down a scale, like say maybe you're doing an E flat scale. I'm gonna get loud on the E flat, I'm gonna get soft on the E flat. So two measures with the E flat. And then I'm gonna go up, count it out. Louder, softer. Let's count your G, louder, softer. I want you to play nice full five counts very evenly as you're getting louder and then nice full five counts of getting softer. Make sure that you get louder and softer at an even rate. Uh, if it were a speedometer, I don't want you to have number one, two, six. I want one and two and three and four and five and breathe. Five and four and three and two and one. So that it's very, very even as you're getting louder and softer. Um, as you're doing this, make sure that you have on a tuner or a drone and listen for the center of your pitch. Trust the pitch uh, first and the tone will often end up following that. I'm going to leave you to this exercise. Set the uh, metronome to about 72 or so and why don't you try number one and I'll see you in just a minute. So that's most of everything that we have. Um, a good comprehensive fundamental routine will include a little bit of non-musical work ahead of time, stretching, breathing, a little bit of buzzing would be good just to make sure that we're getting to the roots of our sound production. It's then gonna have some kind of long tone because everything else that we do should come from the long tone. That air column as we're going through our flexibility should be just as consistent and unceasing as when we're playing a whole note. Go from the long tone through some flow studies maybe and take that into flexibility so that we're moving around between the partials on the instrument, between those slots on the instrument with consistency. Don't be scared to let it be a little bit goofy at first if that's allowing you to connect your air instead of trying to slot 
than those. It's more important about how you do the slurs than just getting through the slurs. And then take your flexibility into articulation. I might even use some of the same patterns. To 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 whatever it ends up being, I'm going to make sure that I've still got the same continuity of air and I've got the same consistency of tone. So let that come from the long tone idea as well. And then with all of those three categories, long tones, flexibility, and articulation, make sure you're doing them at a full range of dynamics and in the, across the full register of your instrument, both very high and very low, not just in the middle where it's comfortable. Please keep in mind that as you're working on this stuff, you probably won't be very good at it at first. And that's okay. Trial and error is a thing. So hang in there. What we've done today are all skill and technique building exercises. And it's really easy to get bogged down in the minutia and the physicality of things like that. I hope that by adding a renewed focus on your sound quality and the natural learning process and allowing trial and error, we're going to let you get through them more easily and that they will hopefully stick better from session to session. And you won't have quite so much of that backpedal that sometimes we run into where we get really good and then we come into the next session and we feel like we've lost it all. Hopefully this will stick better. Our goal with exercises like these is not to become robotic but rather to reinforce the organic relationship between you and your instrument. Hopefully, we get to the point where the instrument becomes like the voice, simply an extension of yourself, something that you don't have to stop and think about, just something that you use to express yourself. The last and potentially the most important part of my daily work with my instrument is to play through an etude or play through a, a lyrical solo of some, of some sort. Each one of those etudes is a story, and we have to practice telling the story. All of these exercises that we've worked on are just giving you a skill set that will allow you to tell a more interesting and varied story. If all you ever do is talk like this, most people don't enjoy listening to you. You have to be dynamic with your music. You have to express something. So pick an etude, find a, a book. There's etudes online. Uh, I, I love the Bordoni books. Uh, we have Rose Etudes, we have Tyrell Etudes, we have Blazevich Etudes. It, it, it goes on and on and on. Any music website you go to, any music teacher you talk to, will have a host of Etude books that they would encourage you to try. So get your hands on some of those. And then pick an Etude and work on it for a week or so. And just practice figuring out what that story is. Every single one of those phrases is like a sentence from the book. Every single one of those sections inside of the etude is like a paragraph. And you have to tell us that story. It's not a skill that's going to come naturally to most people. You have to practice it. So, how does the etude make you feel? Are you at the beach? Are you walking through the park? Is it sunny? Is it rainy? Uh, you got to figure out the emotions that you, that you want and then start to use these skills. Apply all of these little skills that we've been working on to tell me a very interesting story. That's the only thing that your audience is there for, after all. So let's make sure that that's something that we make as one of our priorities, too, not just being able to move our fingers fast or play a high note. It has to be about more than that. I think that's just about everything. We're just about out of time. I look forward to hearing you all tell me your interesting stories someday. Uh, and until then, take care, and thanks for listening.